Welcome back to a new video in the multi-thread series here on the Ludwig Fussel channel. Yeah, uh, a bit time has progressed since the last video. I'm back from vacation and yeah, I actually wanted to make and bring this video earlier, but I had a bug in the uh, source code and I hadn't time to investigate it. I just wanted to like bash through the video and cut it like the last time that I had available, but I had a bug and I was like, okay, I was already too long on the computer, already too long programming. I cannot solve this yet. So... Yeah, I came back to the computer and <laughs> immediately found the bug and you need to fix this as well in case you worked uh, along with that code. So basically we have this do work function here which starts at the offset and goes to count. And you can already see what the issue is. Of course you need to go to offset plus count and this actually screwed up the counter uh, in case we have more than multiple threads which is of course still failing because we have multiple threads and the issue that we explained last video which is also called a race condition something i also forgot to mention last video and uh, yeah you still have the issue i mean i can show this to you i now have this set to one thread so you can see like in case i start this that the assertion also like succeeded with the um, actual code that i have uh, like modified so now we have 0 0.8 seconds and everything is good but now as far as soon as i go like to four threads you will also see like that the performance is actually not that big and as was i already like was a bit like wait a minute why is it actually so a great performance boost but i was was like okay it looks like it's working but it actually was because the other threads were just not working it was just one thread that was doing less work and the other ones were not doing work because i had this offset issue but yeah now we can see like with the proper code we are not that fast than last video but we are still like faster let's see 3.2 3.0.2 uh, 0 0.3 seconds but we are going to still have our assertion issue because like the basic idea uh that I that I had the uh, that I explained the last video is still holding up because like this is the theory behind this and just because I have an implementation uh, issue doesn't mean that like the full implementation that I have done is like garbage and my explanation is garbage it was just like this code issue but the, the, the explanation still holds up all right so now after like fixing all that issues we could actually like commit this fix fix stuff like just doing a simple commit here there we go uh, we now need to actually serialize the access to this done work and we can do this by using two constructs of programming of concurrent programming uh, the one is locked programming and the other one is lock free programming so what is the idea so basically the idea of a lock is to basically lock up this resource so basically if you have a locker and just one key to this locker and in case you hand this key around like speaking like in this uh, pictured language so basically if you just have one key and you always hand the key from each thread to another thread you can always like serialize the access all threads are just kind of like sitting in a queue and uh, as soon as like one thread has like opened up the lock they just drops the queue in a box and all threads run to that box and try to snatch the key and the first thread that gets kind of like the key can kind of like unlock the lock and do its work even through programming it's a bit different in programming you are always like locking the lock you basically lock up the resource while you're accessing it and as soon as you are kind of like uh are done working with that resource you unlock the lock or in kind of like speaking a bit more like how you would kind of like call this you acquire a lock you acquire this lock to access the resource and as soon as you are done working with that resource you release the lock all right so basically a lock can be acquired and released but the underlying construct that is used for the lock may have some different functions for example lock lock and unlock and we're going to start by using a very simple construct that is already included in C++. We're going to use the so-called uh, mutex. So we're just going to include mutex and we're just going to create a mutex. Mutex, of course, you need to ah uh, to uh, type this correctly. So I'm going to have this uh, counter mutex because it's like locking this work counter here. And now I just need to modify my code here. So before I'm going to access my uh, work, so before I'm doing this increment here, I'm just going to take my mutex and I'm going to lock this. So basically locking a mutex um, is a blocking function. So basically this function will take as long as the lock cannot be acquired. So this will block the execution of our program until the current thread has acquired the lock. 
Then, after I have acquired this lock, I can do my work and I can unlock this lock or release this lock to give the access back to other threads. There's also like a conditional function, so because like blocking functions may not actually be good, you may actually want to do other work while you're kind of like are not allowed to access this lock. So there's also a try lock function, which gives you back a boolean. So you could something do like while not mutex try lock, blah, 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 do different stuff, for example. But not going to use this here. We're just going to use a plain dumbass simple lock incrementing unlock, which is uh, good enough for this use case. So just to prove that everything is still up and working, just gonna reduce this back to one thread and just gonna see how this performs. It will actually, as you can already see, perform worse. We are now instead of 0 0.8, like 0 0.8 seconds, we are now at 2 seconds. This is just because we are using a mutex and the mutex has some overhead. So basically we have one thread that is basically now always taking the key, unlocking the lock, throwing away the key, taking the key back and like stuff like that that takes just time instead of just sitting there and like crunching numbers but yeah we actually think that we can improve this by just using more threads and now that we have kind of like the threads running like uh, very good and without any big issues there and crunching numbers and being fast well are they fast no 7.6 seconds instead like 0 0.8 seconds with like one thread this is not good not good at all i mean like our example is still a bit yeah a bit bad because like you wouldn't dispatch threads for this function, for this simple computation. Even though we are doing this like many times. But we are kind of like still on a bad number. But this will be now, these 7.6 seconds will be our new reference number. And we will start from this reference number and we will go down until we find an implementation that is faster than this 7.6 microseconds and uh, milliseconds. Uh, seconds, sorry, I'm like bad. Yeah, all right. So let's do some proper multi-threading here. Now we have kind of like done one way of doing this like locked with locks. And now we are doing this again with locks, but with a different lock. So basically a mutex is an operating system construct. So we are always calling windows to create that mutex. We are calling windows to lock this mutex. We are calling like a wait for single object for that mutex on the windows side. So we are kind of like calling several operating system functions and each call to the operating system does take time. And actually, if you're using like this mutex, it may actually be that like you are going into the windows threads scheduler. So basically if you're calling lock on a mutex and the operating system detects that the mutex is currently in use it could actually be that like the full thread is put to sleep and it's being subscribed to that mutex and then we are going through windows scheduling and windows scheduling does take some time and then we have like bad numbers so we don't want to have windows here on this side so yeah screw that mutex we're not going to use mutex in this series what we're going to use is atomics so atomics are a special um, intrinsics a special uh like instructions that can run on a modern desktop processor and these atomic instructions are guaranteed to be uh, concurrent so basically there are a set of instructions and they are by its nature how they are built uh, serialized so they are actually working like on the memory controller and not like on the core the main, the, the main instructions so basically normally you load a number from the bus you do the, the calculations in the cpu and then you are storing it back to the bus so back to the memory and basically these atomic instructions basically are something like add to a memory location a value. So basically these instructions are just built to never be loaded to the CPU to just operate on the memory bus. And the memory bus by its nature is serialized because there's just one electrical connections between the CPU and the RAM. Or not one like copper wire, not, not just one trace. There are many traces, but it's just like... in case it let's just take the bus as a construct like you're also taking like your cpu as a construct and your gpu as a construct there's just one bus that connects everything it's not correctly it's actually like a special memory bus but simply speaking it's just one bus and we can actually take advantage of that by using these atomics by default atomics are quite complicated but we want to start very simple so we're going to start with an atomic flag which is basically Atomic simplified, simplified to a, a simple object with just a few functions. So this flag is basically uh, very similar to a mutex, but it operates a bit differently. We need actually to uh, take some, some more considerations by using this flag, but basically by default it works just like a mutex. So basically what you do is you kind of like lock the flag, 
and you unlock the flag. But because we are now not having a mutex, we are having a flag. So the flag is basically a boolean value. And we can clear this boolean value and we can set it. Basically clearing this boolean value will set it to false and setting the boolean value will set it to 1. And zero means this is unlocked, the resource is unlocked, and one means the resource is locked. So, of course, the last action that we need to take is we need to clear it so that it is zero and signaled as I am free. So, the other one that we need to do is Z. As you can see, Z is not available because it would be dumb. Because just setting it this to one would have no point because we are not kind of like getting a feedback what is the previous value. You can actually do a, a, a get or basically it's actually not called get, it's actually called test, but test is not available. We, In case we want to actually use tests, we would need to go into our properties and go to CPP20. If case I go to CPP20, this test will work. This will actually give us the old value, but we are not going to go to C++20. I want to go strictly to C++17 because like, well, this is what you have available in case you're not having the latest Visual Studio version. So. CPP 2017 and uh, we go for that. Actually, just calling test is never a good idea in case you want to actually acquire this. There is a special function called test and set. So basically what this function will do, it will always set the value to true, but it will actually give you the old value back. So it will actually give you the value that the uh, flag was already on before you called this. So basically, if it was already at one and you set it, you are not changing it because, uh, well, setting a value that is already at 1, setting this to 1 is just like just leaving it at 1. Uh, but what we actually want to do, we actually want to take a look at the value that is coming back from that. So while this value is 1, so while this lock is actually set, so acquired, so while this lock is locked, having a value of 1, we are just doing a while loop that is doing nothing. So basically this while with just a semicolon, which is just saying do this while, while the condition is met. So while the value of the flag is 1, we are just continuing an infinite loop, always setting that, setting that, setting that, setting that, until we are getting a 0, which means that the lock, the flag was not acquired. So we are getting a 0, but now it is 1. And we can now safely increment our counter, which is like a different variable. And after we are done with our work, we are clearing this to zero. This is unconditional, so we will always clear to zero. So this will go with one serialized memory operation to zero. And the next, like test and set, will get this zero back again. And will thus the thread that was calling that, the CPU that executed that calling uh, function that says and set, will get this zero. But just one single thread will get this zero. So just one thread will succeed here and do its increment and clearing the flag and doing its computations and stuff. So basically, this is the equivalent of doing locks here. So let's just start this and see what's happening. And this could actually fail on your system. It shouldn't be because compilers are smart and stuff, but this could fail. So you can kind of like see it, it works. The, we get no assertion error, which is good. Uh, we are using, I think we are still back on uh, four threads. Yeah, we are. So this is actually running on four threads. It is uh, giving us no assertion error, but it is actually performing as worse as our mutex does. And actually we can optimize this while actually making our program safer. Uh, compilers are actually quite smart nowadays, but uh, at some point they are actually too smart and they actually think, all right, okay, I could actually like move this up here. The compiler could think, let's move this up here because, well, I can do some reordering. It's not, it's actually not, I, I don't care what's going on there. Okay, and now he's setting a value and clearing that. Well, I don't need this. So in case you're actually unlucky, the compiler could optimize your program down to that instead of having this. Ah, uh, not this this. So the compiler could actually go in there and do some instruction reordering. Actually, the CPU also does instruction op uh, reordering at some point. So there are several steps of optimization that could kill your functionality. And we need to prevent this. And preventing that is done with actually some memory uh, orders. By default, these uh, functions have some very constrained memory ordering. So by default, nothing can happen to this because, well, this is built to be rock solid. So if you're just using test and set and clear, everything is good because you are kind of like locking up every optimization that could happen. But this is bad because locking up all optimization means like these bad timings of what was it? Eight seconds, seven seconds, six seconds, six seconds, I think. No, and now four seconds, whatever. So five seconds here, uh, this is bad. And we can actually like give the compiler a hint and all optimization says a hint of what we are doing. So uh, we are doing some memory ordering. 
and basically what this action is doing it is acquiring a lock so we are specifying the memory order acquire so we are acquiring a lock and down here we are freeing a lock or releasing a lock so this is acquiring this is release and this now prevents that from flowing up there and that from flowing down there so basically nothing can go below that and nothing can go above that and it also like gives the compiler a hint how to optimize this and if we start this now we should be faster uh, at least yeah we are, we are a bit faster at 3.2 seconds so basically we are now twice as fast as a mutex so we already like gained speed by just using a construct on our own. I know it's a bit tough with all that memory ordering and it is actually much to, to say here, but I want to make this as compact as possible. Yeah, but we are now doing this uh, quite like the mutex way, the spin lock way. So you kind of like call this construct that we have used here a spin lock. It is like a lightweight mutex and this lightweight mutex is called a spin lock. But this isn't fast. We are like still at, why do I always close this console? I don't know, but we are still at like four seconds, maybe three seconds. I mean, yes, 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 I am on debug and you can't profile on debug, but I'm doing this on debug. I mean, I cannot rely on the values. It's good. It's good. It's okay. I don't care. It is like doing stuff and uh, it is at least like a hint where we are going. Of course, if we want to have some accurate tables, we should do this on release. I know. Alright, so uh, yeah, you can kind of like see that we are like twice as fast in the best case uh, than our mutex. But this is not fast enough. We want to make something different, which is faster. And well, we are actually doing that. And this is done by using plain atomics. I already told you that there are like atomic instructions like adding a value to the already existing value on the bus. And we're gonna use this by wrapping our unsigned int in an std atomic, which is basically saying, hey, this shall use atomic instructions. And now we can actually do atomic instructions and we're gonna do this in two ways. We're gonna show you, I'm gonna show you the hard way first. Uh, unsigned int, uh, old value and new value. So we're gonna do a bit uh, the hard way first and then we're gonna do this the easy way. And actually now we are doing log free programming because now we are using plain intrinsic instructions. So basically we are doing no locking, no freeing. We are doing this like atomically. Uh, we are now out of the lock way. So there's no lock involved here. We're gonna still, the first approach is like nearly as slow, actually slower than a lock. And uh, yeah, but I wanna actually show you how you could do this, especially if you have some complex computations that you need to do. So basically there is a, a function available that is called uh, compare exchange strong. Uh, there's also a weak function, but be a bit careful with this weak function because if you don't know what you're doing and uh, you shouldn't, you should always start using the strong instruction in case you're actually uh, the strong function in case you actually want to do some nifty optimizations, you can actually try out and play a bit around with the weak. But just for starters, always take the strong one. Only optimize the stronger way in case you actually have performance issues. All right, this compare exchange is actually uh, operating uh, on a very easy way. So basically you input the expected value and the desired value. And what this atomic instruction is doing, so basically serialized on the memory bus, it will take a look at the memory location you are exchanging and it will compare this to the expected value. And in case these values actually match, this function will return true and set the desired value as the new value of the memory location. In case, the expected value is not equal to the look to the memory on the bus so the memory on the memory location given by that exchange function in case they are not equal this function will return false and will not do anything to the data located on the memory bus and we can easily do this so we are actually expecting this old value and we want to input a new value here all right so old and new here and to get the old value we are taking our done work and we're gonna load the value from that we could also write this like that and we could also like write done work is equal to uh, done work plus one this would also work but you should always try to use this function on atomics because uh, that people actually see that you are using atomics because in case you're just having normal statements it can easily be confusing uh, while some code takes so long why does the simple assign take that long yes because it's an atomic but you may not actually see this at the, at the first point so you should always try to use the functions to be explicit what you are doing so we're going to take the old value 
and we're gonna assign this to the new value plus one. So basically what we are doing is we are loading the old value, we are adding one to the old value, and then we are exchanging that, and while this exchange operation is failing, we are continuing this loop until it succeeds. So let's start this and see how this performs. And it will perform horrible, I can already tell you. Because like, well, of course we haven't issued any any, uh, oh, it's actually not that horrible, it's 3.8, 3 I actually would have expected this to be a bit more horrible, but okay. Um, it's still not good, but it's like the same, It's uh, it is as fast as lock locking programming. Uh, let's make this a bit faster. Let's make this a bit faster by optimizing the memory order. So actually what we're doing here, we're going to consume the value here and I'm actually having a, a memory order uh, sequential here, so we're gonna consume the value and the load and we're gonna uh, set this as sequential just be, to be explicit. I don't think that we are being a bit faster, but just putting some memory orders there is a bit is a good idea. We're actually a bit slower, but I don't think that is actually like from the thing that we have inputted here. Not quite sure, we could also try er something more, but let's just keep this at the values here. Alright, um, this is like a good idea, but it's still not performant enough. So uh, let's optimize this a bit more. In case you actually look at this, this is actually like using locks because we are taking the old value, the new value, we are storing the old one, we are putting the new one in and we are having a loop until the values match. So this is basically just as equal as uh, using some flags. It may actually perform worse as you could already see. So we need to make this a bit faster. And we're gonna make this faster. We are doing a fetch add. We are fetch adding one. Darn and simple. Start. 0 0.8 seconds. There we are. Like, optimized, stuff, finished. All right, now let's actually explain this a bit better. So basically these fetched functions are actually functions that operate on the memory bus. So basically this fetched add, you give it a memory location and you give it a value and it will basically atomically add something to that value. There are also like other fetched functions. There's also like, uh, let's see, fetched uh, add and or subtract xor. So you can add something, you can and logically and something, you can logically or something, you can logically x or something, and you can logically subtract something. This is everything you need from an instruction uh, standpoint. You can like also like use the logical operators here. So you could like say or equals 0x ff. This would also work because it's also wrapping to that. You could also like also um, you could also like say, yeah, 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 maybe in do something like not equal, invert, done work. You could like do everything to that because it will always like work in case you use it. But I would like rather advise you to stick to this function as always because we actually know that they are atomic. Because like if you have some exotic expression here like done work is equal to done work. Done work plus, yeah, let's say done work is bigger, is bigger than 100. Then we're gonna do done work or uh, 0xff or we are doing 5. Something like that. You don't know how this boils down. This could boil down to load, 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 compare exchange. But in case you actually have this code, you know how this works. So even through, like, you could use this atomic blindly and just do wrap everything you use from multiple threads into an atomic and write your stuff, but this is not gonna help you. This is gonna bring you in devil's kitchen, like people say. Oh, what? What? Yeah, okay. Uh, this can, like, bring you to very bad stuff that things, things are not working like expected because you have your computations and they may actually give you the wrong value because, like, let me maybe undo this a bit. It could actually be that this full expression here is evaluated and then it is compare exchanged. And in case this compare exchange fails, what happens? Does it recompute that on the right? It should, but does it really does that? So it's like, ah, it's not a good idea to use this expression. Try to stick to the actual functions instead of dumbly, plainly writing to that. So just take my advice and just use this function. I mean, we could also like, add some memory order or we should actually 
like use the memory ordering but actually this memory ordering should be actually relaxed uh, i hope it's not uh, inlining that so in, ca in, in case it is not inlining that this is actually relaxed because we don't care what is done first here so relax is, it should be actually like the the proper way of doing that and it's still performing like the same because well there was nothing to reorder so it shall actually actually not uh, be different from the default memory order so yeah but it actually let me let me input what we could actually try out and maybe do some memory or uh, sequential the shell actually uh, should actually perform similar in time in terms of time yeah i say it's actually like we don't have any more functionality here so we can actually like put this on sequential uh so this is not a big of an de a big deal here so let's yeah let's just keep this like that so uh yeah we actually like done let's just keep my uh uh my uh my my conventions here and also call the lord function now down here in the assert to be 100 percent safe and consistent so you can see like now we have like talked very uh long here uh to wrap this in atomic yeah like good I mean, like, it's much to do for just some simple stuff like that. But yeah, this is just how atomic programming works But the, and concurrent programming. The thing is that concurrent programming is built on so much more than that. It's like, this is like the toolkit that you at minimum need to start into that. But you can, like, write fancy lock classes, write your iLock class, lock guards, uh, uh, writing your guarded objects and stuff like that. I don't know if I actually have some code available. Do I have some code available for that? I'm not quite sure. I don't know what I have on GitHub and what I don't have on GitHub, but I need actually Firefox for that. We can actually take a look. Maybe I have already some code up on GitHub. I'm not quite sure. I have already written such classes, but I'm not quite sure if I do have this available. Where are my repositories? Uh, do I have this somewhere? Not quite sure. Let's actually zoom in that you can see stuff. No, I don't have this here, but it could be in my gists. I am not. I think I I, sh I may have something in my gists. How do I have something in my gists? It's a good question. No, I don't have something in my gist. This is quite unfortunate. I shall actually, like, at one point, uh, maybe uh, give you that code that I have already written. But I may do some additional video in case you're interested in that. You can maybe write something in the comments and I may do a video where we I explain to you how you write basically your basic toolkit that you need for concurrent programming. So, like, your basic lock class, spin locks, maybe routine and locks... Uh, lock guards objects that guard these locks so in case if function goes out of scope the lock is released guarded objects so basically just a wrapper that you can put around every object that you desire that automatically guards it creates proxies that can access it read only proxies proxies that can always read and you have like infinite number of uh, read only proxies available and write only or read write proxies that can read and write but just one is allowed stuff like that so i may can i can actually like do a video on that if in case you are interested in so that I can show you a bit of more how you would kind of like write production ready code for uh, some basic atomic locking. It's just locking. I mean, it would just be another video on locking. Uh, in case you're actually working lock free, you always have to kind of like come up with your own algorithms there. I mean, like I could try to give you a video which uses atomics to maybe create a quad tree or memory allocator trees that are kind of like allowing multiple allocations at a time that are not completely locking all threes, three, all the, the, the full three that is basically traveling around the three to, to, to the three to find an allocation slot that is, 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 is fitting on multiple threads. Yeah, I could do some videos on that, but this would do some more additional research. But you can actually write what you are interested in and at, at, at multi-threaded programming. And I may do some special videos that are out of this series, just like kind of like some videos. I may also still put them into the same series here, but kind of like not as these planned three videos. All right. So thank you for watching. Next videos, I'm going to uh, introduce you to C++, uh, sorry, to WinRP threads to do some more threading with the Windows API and Windows API can do a bit more to threads because you can kind of like also kill threads and stuff like that. Priorities adding labels to your threads so that can actually keep track in the debugger because like the debugger is 
Yeah, not like that, but in case I'm just gonna make a break point here, you kind of like the debugger is at one thread, and basically it's like this uh, UCTR based DLL thread, and you have like the anti DLL thread and the main thread, and you're actually not. You don't know where you are actually. I mean, I can like switch around at these different threads and I can like see that they are not in scope and there's something that loaded. This is on kernel and whatever. And I just can keep track of the current and my main thread. And it's not, not like, yeah, quite, yeah, quite good. So, uh, it's always good to kind of like have labels as your thread that also show up in Visual Studio for debugging purposes. And this is all like the topic of the next video for uh, Windows threads. So thank you for watching. Gonna see us in the uh, next video. Make sure to like and subscribe. I'm gonna wish you a nice day. Bye.